Turn with me in your Bible to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. This is the epistles reading for, from the lectionary calendar for this Sunday. Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm going to be reading the first 10 verses. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming and not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First, he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will we have been made holy, through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Dear God, our Father, I thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us that we will celebrate in just a few weeks at Easter. Thank you for all of your blessings. Guide our minds and spirits as we listen and hear your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Any of you remember The Shadow, the radio program? My father used to quote the introductory phrase in this really, in the radio program, it was this really creepy voice that came on. Who knows what evil lurks in the minds of men? The Shadow knows. My father used to quote that every once in a while. So this is another thing in in memory of him. That iconic radio program inspired pulp novels and comic strips and books for many years. And in fact, in some ways, The Shadow was the very first superhero. Marvel and DC Comics came after that, and they kind of followed that example. But that's not The Shadow I'm talking about today. The author of the epistle to the Hebrews, who I believe to be Paul the Apostle, was dealing with the intersection of the old traditional Judaism as they had preserved it through the exile to Babylon and the centuries of domination by empire after empire. The Jews had preserved their heritage and they had preserved the scriptures and they had preserved their religion. You have to give them credit for that. But Paul is having to deal with the intersection of all that stuff that had been saved with the new Christianity that had come onto the world. Although Judaism traces its origin back to the covenants God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Judaism is defined by the law of Moses, the law that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. Both the origin from Abraham of Judaism and the law of Moses are laid out in the great detail in the first five books of the Bible. They're called the Torah by Jews, or sometimes called the Pentateuch by Greek Jews. Now, interestingly enough, certain Jewish sects, such as the Samaritans, accept only the Torah as scripture. They do not consider Psalms and Proverbs and Obadiah and 
Daniel to be scripture because they think that only scripture is the first five books of the Testament, the law of Moses. Whenever we read the term the law of Moses in the New Testament, that is what it's referring to is the Torah, the first five books. Jesus also spoke sometimes of the law and the prophets. And that means he's referring to the whole Old Testament that we have. Hebrews 10 begins with the statement that the law of Moses was only a shadow or a precursor of the good things that God had for us, has for us. God gave the law of Moses to his chosen people, the Jews, the descendants of Abraham, to instruct them how to live and also to lay a foundation for the salvation that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would later bring to us. Under the law, as most of today's passage explains, salvation came from the once-a-year sacrifices of the high priest on the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. Once a year, the priest would offer a sacrifice for his own sin and then offer another sacrifice for the sins of the people. And then they would be good for a year. This is how it was until Jesus Christ, the Messiah, came to offer himself as a sacrifice on the cross, a one-time sacrifice for all people throughout all time. With his death and resurrection that we're going to celebrate in a few weeks at Easter, Jesus began building his house on the foundation that was already laid. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, Together we are his house, built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. So let's stop and think about this. What other shadows or precursors of what God has in store for us can you find in the Bible? In the book of Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, tells us that the tabernacle that Moses built and by inference the temple that followed are shadows or a copy of something in heaven. There is an ark of the covenant in heaven that is even greater than the ark that Moses built. There is a tabernacle in heaven even greater than the tabernacle that Moses built. The things that Moses built were just copies, shadows. You know, rich people have huge diamond rings sometimes, right? But very often they also have a copy of that same diamond ring that they wear around on normal days so that they can store the real one in the vault and keep it safe. Well, the law, the tabernacle, the temple, they're like that. They're copies of the real thing that's in heaven preserved for us safe. And as I mentioned in Ephesians uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, we ourselves are the building that's being built, the body of Jesus. So what was the purpose of the law of Moses then? For that matter, what's the purpose of any law, such as the speed limit? There's a sign right around the bend right there that says 6-0 on it. And what happens if you drive 8-0 past that sign? My father-in-law says you'll make the acquaintance of a nice man in a uniform. Sometimes they're not so nice if you go too fast. According to Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. Paul then explained that the law of Moses or any other law is not for righteous people, but for lawbreakers and rebels. In other words, the purpose of law in general, and of course the law of Moses in specific, is to specify what is right and what is wrong and to set boundaries for us to live in. 
You know, sometimes we chafe at boundaries. Do you remember the song, I Can't Drive 55? But can you imagine playing volleyball or football or basketball or baseball without any rules at all? You have arguments. You say, that was out of bounds. They say, no, it wasn't. Yes, it was. If there's no rules, there are no boundaries, how can you play a game? I have a son who likes to modify rules of games that we're playing. And sometimes that makes it hard. Sometimes, though, he's kind of funny. If we're playing Monopoly, he will spot you money when you go out of business and you're bankrupt, just to keep the game going. Paul also used another illustration for what the law is and what its purpose is. It's the illustration of a tutor. In the Greek society of of Paul's time, it was very common for a, a rich family to hire a tutor for their children. Either they would hire a tutor or they would buy a slave who was educated. And this tutor would be now in charge of the children to raise them up and to teach them. The tutor had responsibility of teaching the children of the household, and he had authority over them. He didn't just have the responsibility of teaching them, but he had a switch as well to enforce it. And and Paul tells us that the law is like that. When we were young, when we were young and not knowing any better, we needed the law to teach us what right and wrong are. But when we become mature Christians, Jesus has set us free from the law. Jesus and Paul both were accused of being antinomianism, antinomians. And that means somebody who is against all law. An antinomian wants anarchy, no law at all. But Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. One of the issues that Jesus fought with constantly in his ministry was not just the law, but what the scribes and the Pharisees had added to the law. They took the law of Moses. The law of Moses said, don't work on Sunday. And the Pharisees said, okay, you can only travel so far from your house on Sunday because if you're going farther than that, you're working. And you can't kindle a fire on Sunday because that's work. That means if you go to Israel today and go to a fancy hotel, you'll find an elevator that's the Shabbat elevator. Because when you're pushing the button on the elevator, you're kindling a little tiny spark of a fire. So that means that you have to have a Shabbat elevator that just goes up and down by itself all day without pushing any buttons. Because it's work on Sunday to push a button on Shabbat. And Jesus fought with that because that was not what was in the law. That was, these were rules and regulations that people added to the law. Well, Paul the Apostle commanded in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, that we obey the law of Christ, which includes carrying each other's burdens. Paul was not against all law, but rather for the law of Christ the law of love. However, I have to say, Paul was against imposing the whole law of Moses on Gentile Christians. The law of Moses was given to the Israelites when they left Egypt, and it included civil law, like do not steal, and included religious law, and included ceremonial law, how to do different kinds of feasts and sacrifices and things like that, and tassels on your cloak and the way you cut your hair. That's because the people of Israel, when they left Egypt, they didn't have any body of law. They didn't have any tradition of law. They had been slaves for 400 years. So they needed a whole body of law. Well, when Gentiles began to become Christians, there were certain Jewish Christians who would come along and say that, okay, you're part of us now, you have to obey all of our rules. And Paul said, no, 
And eventually that became such a situation that they had to have a council of the apostles in Jerusalem. And in that letter, the council of apostles said that the only parts of the Mosaic law that are binding on Gentile Christians are do not eat, mud, bl- uh, do not eat meat with blood in it or strangled animals. That actually goes all the way back to Noah. God told Noah, don't eat meat with the lifeblood in it. And then they said, do not indulge in sexual immorality. Those are the things that are binding on Gentile Christians. Um, The Council of Jerusalem didn't say anything about stealing. It didn't say anything about kidnapping. Because we all know that those things are wrong. And the Roman government had a perfectly fine judicial system for dealing with murder and stealing and kidnapping as our country has a good judicial system for dealing with those very things. So the Council of Jerusalem took the parts of the law that are not part of civil law, and that's what we have. So where do we go wrong with the law, anyway? The Jews of Jesus' time had the law of Moses, And they kind of went wrong because they didn't understand that it was the foundation. It was not the thing. The thing would be the building that Jesus would build on top of this foundation. His body, the body of Christ. You know, imagine you're building a house. Has anybody here built their own house? I have participated in building houses. I haven't actually built one myself. Well, you start out with an excavator. Come, somebody comes in with a backhoe and they dig holes in the ground, right? And then cement mixers come and they come pour concrete in the holes and they make a foundation. You can't have a house without a foundation. But what would happen if you decided this foundation is so perfect that we're just going to stop here and this will be our house? What would that be like? Well, you'd be living on a concrete slab in the open air. The foundation is necessary, but it's not the house. The house is what you build on top of the foundation. And the Jews' problem was that they were stuck with the foundation and they couldn't move forward. What other things can we do with the law that's wrong? Well, one thing is that all of us, Jews and Gentiles alike, is that we like to add things. We are saved by the atonement of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection. But for some reason, we like to add things onto that. Right? And even better yet, we want to have a little checklist that we can check off. And then see, I have all my things checked off. Do you have all your things checked off? That's something we make up rules for ourselves. But the problem is, We make those same rules and we want other people to obey them as well. Um, I'm going to step out on a branch here. John and Jerry struggle sometimes with the rules that Native Americans have set on themselves for worship in the church. There are some people who say that drums are bad. And there are some people that say that drums are good. Well... If you look at the Bible, it doesn't say anything about drums either way, right? Right. But we have this thing inside us that we want to make up our own rules and add them. So it's the atonement of Jesus Christ plus not playing drums. Or plus whatever you want to add to the rules. That's the other way that we mess up on the rules and where we go wrong. The thing to remember, the bottom line, is that salvation comes from God as a free gift so that none of us can boast. And even the faith that we have to take that salvation is a free gift. Our salvation is paid for by the atonement, the shedding of Jesus' blood on the cross and confirmed by the resurrection that we will celebrate in a few weeks. Okay, I'm going to read the benediction shortly, and then we will sing the doxology after that.
Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.